Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Quiet, please. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so this evening, um, we've got a presenter, talker, uh, Masaki Hayashi uh, from the professor at the University of Calgary. Um, I've got to know him a little bit over the last few years. Um, not really that well. We met in person, what, 20 minutes ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so in uh, about 2008, I think it was, um, I saw an ad in the local paper. Um, I live outside of Calgary, just north of Cochrane. And uh, they were uh, asking for volunteers to join a program called, which subsequently got called the Rocky View Well Watch. So we all measure the depth of the water in our wells every two, three, four weeks, whatever. Um, send the information to Dr. Hayashi, and he then puts it together in uh, whatever format he wants. And uh, he's going to give us a presentation this evening on uh, what it's all about. So I'll hand right over to him. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, I was just uh, going to put my microphone here, and then I am ready. Uh, well, good uh, evening, uh, the folks uh, in the restaurant here and the folks on Zoom. Uh, I'm uh, Masaki Hayashi from the University of Calgary. And I'll just switch over to uh, the PowerPoint here. OK. OK, so um, yes. Uh, so thank you uh, for uh, having me uh, for this uh, evening. Uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and uh, uh, they are talking about uh, groundwater uh, in the area around Calgary and how um, we as uh, citizen scientists are organizing ourselves to monitor groundwater levels in uh, Rocky View County. I'm just gonna change this to a uh, razor pointer. Uh, okay. I, so um, the, the title of my uh, seminar today is a community-based groundwater monitoring in Rocky View County uh, using citizen science uh, approach. So on the left, uh, you see a uh, typical uh, well uh, for a rural house. In, in this case, this was actually a farmhouse. And then, uh, so I'll tell you a bit more about this later, but um, uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, much of the prairies, um, so the people living in the big cities like Calgary were relying on the, the river water, uh, what Supply is cut down to about half now in Calgary, but nevertheless, we get water from the rivers. We're lucky to have that water supply, but uh, outside of the cities, most uh, houses are relying on uh, groundwater. So there are there were concerns that, uh, well, maybe our groundwater uh, use may not be sustainable into the future. So um, we um, you know, got uh, a number of citizens to uh, monitor their house wells uh, to keep eyes on the groundwater levels. Uh, so a, uh, this is a bit pedestrian for most of you engineers, but I'll go through this anyways, just to you know put this in the context of uh, the water in, uh, on the planet. So we have this blue planet. So we all know that there's a plenty of water uh, on our planet. But uh, only about 3% is fresh water. The rest of that is seawater, uh, which is important, obviously, for the marine uh, biology. But uh, for us, uh, as a water resource, that's not very useful. And uh, uh, only 23%, right? Out of 3% of that precious fresh water, only 23% uh, is in liquid. The, the rest, uh, is locked up as ice in Antarctica and the Greenland and uh, some uh, uh, other places. So out of that 23% of liquid water, uh, only a fraction, small fraction of that uh, exists as a what we call surface water, uh, the ones that you can see in rivers and lakes and wetlands. Uh, so that means 97% of usable freshwater resource on the planet uh, occurs as groundwater, which is largely invisible. 
So uh, in our province, uh, water supplies, uh, like I said uh, a few, few minutes ago, the river water supplies, uh, domestic water supplies in major cities, Calgary, Edmonton, the situation is the same in Saskatchewan as well, Regina, Saskatoon, they're all relying on uh, river water. And then groundwater is used in uh, rural areas. So for those folks uh, using groundwater in rural areas, um, so where are they extracted from? So I'm gonna spend the next 10 or 15 minutes just kind of introducing you to this uh, background. Then I'm, I'm gonna talk about the citizen science approach, uh, the groundwater monitoring. So where do we find uh, groundwater? Um, I guess, you know, you are engineers, so you probably don't think that there's a huge big rivers underground, uh, but there are some, you know, that when you have cars to caves, but that's exception. So most cases, uh, the groundwaters uh, occur in the sands and gravels, you know, the porous material. Uh, this is an example. Uh, oops. So these are called aquifers. Uh, so you know, porous sediments uh, that can store groundwater. And then there are other types of sediments. Um, for example, clay. Clay is porous, but the porous spaces in clay are just so tight that uh, viscous water has a hard time getting through uh, the, the small porous spaces in clay. So these are, are, are not considered aquifers. We cannot really use groundwater in this clay. So these Clay and other fine sediments are called aquitard. And we can have groundwater in rocks uh, when uh, the rocks have fractures. So this could be an also a, a good uh, aquifers. Now, so in the populated region of Alberta, um, it, it's called the Edmonton Calgary Lethbridge Corridor. Um, so these are typical uh, types of aquifers and aquitard we find uh, in this region. So we have uh, sand and gravel in, well, let, let me uh, back up. So we have a bedrock uh, within about, you know, tens of meters to about hundred meters of the ground surface. Uh, but then bedrock usually has this glacial sediments. Uh, most of that glacial sediment is called the till. Uh, so till actually has a fair amount of clay, usually about 10 to 20% in weight uh, uh, basis. So the till has a clay, therefore it's an aquitard. And it, sometimes within the till, you have this lens or the layers of sand and gravels. So those are aquifers. It's called inter-till aquifer because it's embedded in the uh, uh, not so permeable till. And then sometimes we have this a valley curved into the bedrock. So these are, you know, the ancient valleys that's filled up. But then in this valley, uh, you may have gravel and sand. So those are called the buried channel uh, aquifers. And then this bedrock, uh, the closest to the ground here is called the Pascapu Formation. Not very far from here, we have this Pascapu Hill. So you see this uh, rocks, uh, sandstones usually show up. So that's part of this Pascapu formation. You got this mudstone, which is not very permeable. So it's considered aquitard and then sandstone aquifer. So these are the main aquifers we encounter. Oh, uh, and then I cannot forget about this alluvial aquifers uh, in the, uh, the floodplain of the rivers. Of, of course, there's a sand and gravel. So if you tap a well into sand and gravel, so you got aquifer. Uh, the town of Okotoks so getting a uh, there was a supply from this alluvial aquifer. Uh, they say they're pumping uh, groundwater, but they're actually pumping uh, river water just filtered through this alluvial aquifers. So uh, this is uh, one type of aquifer that's uh, very common around here. It's a buried channel aquifer. It's, so it's the source of uh, Big Hill Springs. Um, I guess some of you might have visited uh, Big Hill Springs Provincial Park because it's a beautiful area. Uh, and then, so th there's a water gushing out from this uh, uh, aquifer. And then, so we have been monitoring the flow of this Big Hill Creek um, at uh, uh, Gaging Station, uh, just uh, north of Cochrane here. And then we also measure the flow rate of the spring uh, itself. Uh, so just 
in our data show that about 50% of water coming down the Big Hill Creek um, is through uh, the city of town of Cochrane and all the way down to the Bow River. About 50% of that actually comes from a single spring complex. Uh, so the reason why we have such a big amount of flow coming out of Big Hill Springs is that it's actually this buried gravel. There's a big channel of a gravel deposit. So that's providing groundwater to Big Hill uh, Spring. So another example, uh, which is actually the most important aquifer in the Prairie provinces, it's called the Pascapoo Formation Aquifer System. So I, I don't like to call it that Pascapoo Aquifer because it's not really a single uh, body of uh, sandstone. It's probably tens of thousands of small bodies of sandstone. So that's uh, make up this Pascapoo Formation uh, System of Aquifer. So it's encompasses this large region, including Calgary and Edmonton. So there are about you know, more than 64,000 wells registered uh, in this aquifer. So the geologists will tell you that uh, this Pascapu uh, formation uh, was deposited about 66 million years ago in the mountain front. So uh, Rocky Mountains was still rising. So it was eroded and providing a lot of sediments uh, on the mountain front. So it was deposited in an environment similar to the uh, modern uh, river here. And then, so it, it's the sandstone, uh, you know, we use as aquifer are these channels, ancient channels. So that there, it was a sand and then that became solidified and became sandstone. So it's a not really uniform big layer of sandstone, but it, it's actually uh, individual channels that are stacked up. So that's an important thing about groundwater management uh, in Alberta because of what we're dealing with in most cases is this stacked channel uh, like sandstones. So in the field, it looks like this. This is just uh, uh, west of uh, Longview, I believe. Um, actually, I actually took uh, this picture myself about 20 years ago. So you see this uh, sandstone. So that used to be the channel uh, of this big rivers coming out of the mountains. And then this is a mudstone. So this could be aquifer if it's under the water table. And then this could be aquitard. Uh, and then the sandstone tend to be fractured in some places. And then when you have this fractured sandstone, this would be a very good aquifer if you tap your well into this fracture the part of the sandstone, you're looking at, you know, 20 gallon per minute well, 50 gallon per minute well. But in most cases, uh, you know, good sandstone- Good morning, hi, how are you? Uh, good, you? Good, yeah, good. Good, what, what did well, you guys do today? Oh, just listen to a webinar. So th these are sort of, you know, the, the uh, yeah. parlance used uh, by the rural well so owner. So my board. well is 10 gallons per minute. So what that means is uh, you yeah. can pump so you? 10 Mom gallons of water per minute without drawing down the water level in the well in your well too much. Oh, yeah. So if you got five gallons per minute, if you pump it at 20 <laughs> gallons per minute, very soon you're gonna dry your well. Uh, okay. So uh, this is another example. Uh, again, this, you know, the isolated uh, sandstone uh, exposed here and then yeah. embedded in the mudstone. So this is a Glenbow Ranch. Uh, a lot of beautiful place uh, within a, a half an hour drive uh, from the city. And then uh, this sandstone unit here. So we went up there and took a picture. So you see this um, cross bedding. Uh, so it's a geological term uh, indicating that there this sand was deposited in the flowing water environment and it became sandstone uh, later on. So, you know, the province of Alberta, I guess in that province, uh, the provincial government is in charge of uh, licensing groundwater use and then just making sure that the groundwater is used sustainably. So this is how they determine the sustainable pumping rate. So it's based on uh, this very simple model. So you have uh, this aquifer, um, and then you the drillers will drill a well, and then this is a well screen, and this is a ground surface. And initially, the water pressure in the aquifer, so to speak. So this is not really a water table. This is the pressure level 
in the aquifer. So initially flat, it's undisturbed condition. And then you start pumping. So there will be a drawdown of uh, the pressure head. Um, so we call it the cone of depression. So, the, so this line of uh, water indicates the energy, um, energy of water in the aquifer. So, so energy level is higher here. So the water flows from a high energy part to low energy part. And then that causes a flow of water into the well, and then you pump it up. And then, so when um, <clears throat> driller install a new well, um, so they do a test. You know, you pump it at a certain rate for a certain period of time. And then this, this drawdown, uh, drawdown cone is larger uh, when the pumping rate is higher or the aquifer is thinner, uh, less capacity to transmit water from the peripheral region to the well, or the aquifer itself has a lower permeability or a smaller porosity. So all those things, um, we can estimate these things uh, by conducting a pumping test. So typically uh, they do a pumping tests for a certain uh, number of hours. Uh, for small domestic house well, usually they do that for two hours, but for larger water license application, they have to do it for a longer period of time. So uh, this is an example of a pumping test uh, we conducted in town of Iricana about 10 or so years ago. So we pumped it for two days. So the water level in the well went down uh, about two meters after two days. Okay. Now, so you plot this up on the log scale for time. Uh, so I don't have to explain log scale to this audience, but when I go to uh, the, the general public meeting, but this is a challenge for them to understand what the log scale is. But so, and then you don't believe this, but this is this is what Alberta uh, government does uh, require the consultants to do. So you got two day pumping test and you extrapolate it over 20 years on the log scale and then this is the estimated drawdown after 20 years. It looks to be about four meters, okay? So this well has 20 meter of water above the aquifer. So if it drawdown is four meters after 20 years, well, this is probably okay. Okay, let's just give these guys a license and then they can finish the well at certain pumping rate, right? Now, so in this uses a, a very old analytical solution. It's a, a, the mathematical theory that assumes that this aquifer has an infinite extent. So from the well to the end of the aquifer is tens of thousands of kilometers. Uh, so that's the assumption behind this theory and the extrapolation over 20 years. And this is still happening in this province. So, uh, sorry. So my uh, my student uh, looked at this. Okay, so it's a case study for the town of Iricana. So the population of Iricana was only a couple hundred uh, people in 1960s, and then they projected, okay, we're going to go up to you know 1,200 by 2005. So they wanted the water supply, so they got the wells drilled, did the test, and got approval from the province to pump at. 350,000 cubic meter per year. So that was considered a sustainable pumping rate. And this is the actual amount they pump. So 150 cubic, uh, 1,000 cubic meter per year was the maximum they pump. And that's a much lower than uh, approved rate. So this wouldn't cause any difference, right? And then this is what happened. So uh, Alberta government had a, a foresight to actually put the monitoring well about one and a half kilometer from the, uh, the water supply well. And then the water level kept going down and down. So by 2005, it was almost reaching the top of the aquifer. So they were at the blink of drying the aquifer. So they're lucky that they stopped the pumping and they switched to the uh, water supply from Red Deer River. Uh, so they built a pipeline from uh, near Drumheller to Irikada. So they solved the problem. Uh, and the similar things happened in many towns in Alberta. This is the same story in Innisfail. So they got the approval to pump the well at a certain rate and then well failed because drawdown was too much. So 
the this well-based uh, uh, evaluation of a sustainable pumping rate is probably not going to work very well in the future. So what we're going to is a more holistic uh, approach. Uh, we look at the groundwater flow system rather than individual uh, wells. Uh, so this is a textbook picture. Um, so I, I use this when I go to uh, elementary school and I use this for my PhD students uh, courses. So there are a couple of important principles uh, that are generally true for any groundwater flow system. One is that the water table is a subdued replica of a ground surface. So water table here more or less follows the undulation of ground surface. Water table is higher under the hill and lower uh, <clears throat> near the lowland, uh, such as rivers and lakes. And then groundwater flows from high to low. So the high potential to low potential. So what that means is under the hilltop is where the groundwater is added to the water table. And this is called the groundwater recharge. And then the rivers and lakes are where the groundwater uh, comes out to the surface. Sometimes it's visible as the springs. So uh, in the local context, we have this discharge areas where the groundwater is coming out. So this is one of the uh, springs in the Glenbow Ranch a Provincial Park. So it's not a huge spring, but the water is trickling, trickling out. So that's a discharge area. And then we have recharge area. So that's basically the farmlands uh, you know, up uh, from the springs. And then typically uh, the size of this flow system. Uh, so most farmers and acreage owners have wells that are less than 300 feet deep or 100 meter deep. So, so that's the scale we're looking at in the context of groundwater management. And then the horizontal scale is roughly 10 to 20 kilometers. That's a common scale of groundwater flow system. So, uh, you know, some geologists will tell you that, oh, the, the water, you know, groundwater here is coming all the way from Rocky Mountains. Uh, that's not the case. It's usually the local flow system within 10 to 20 kilometers. So, so that's the, the scale that we have to look at in the context of groundwater management. So, um, as I said, the holistic uh, management of water resources. It's called integrated water management. So we have to look at surface water and the groundwater as a single resource. So pretty much all the rivers, including the ones uh, as big as Bow River, all starts from small springs uh, in the headwater regions. And there are hundreds or thousands of them. So that's how it starts. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the uh, Headwater Springs in uh, Lake Ohara uh, watershed. That's where I've been studying uh, groundwater for the last 20 or so years. So this is one of the headwaters of Kicking Horse River. And then that is you know, joining with other tributaries to form a mighty Fraser uh, River. And then not just headwater, there are addition of groundwater along the river channel. And then this discharge of groundwater uh, sustains this groundwater dependent uh, ecosystem. So this is a West Nose Creek, uh, about uh, 10 or so kilometers north of Calgary. And then, so this surrounding land is rather dry, but then this uh, riparian zone has a lush vegetation because groundwater is feeding the moisture through this uh, vegetation. So here is the current thinking of how we manage this uh, groundwater sustainably. So here's a cross section of a watershed. Um, so there's upland areas and there's some creek and then that's the water table. Uh, again, taking similar shape to the ground surface. And then you, we got the charge of uh, snow melt and rainwater, just a small amount, uh, but it does reach the water table. And then we have a discharge of groundwater to feed the uh, base flow of a creek and the wetlands and uh, other things. And then we may be some houses pumping uh, water for their water supply or maybe some other users. And then 
the this is a simple water balance uh, equation. Um, so we have income, which is a re recharge, and then uh, uh, expense or output, discharge and pumping. When the income exceeds expense, uh, you get the change in storage. So the storage will go up. In this case, the water level will go up. But in times when the expense uh, exceeds income, and then storage will go down. But as a whole, over long time, decadal scale, so the recharge should balance pumping and discharge. So in other way, so you have a recharge, if you take out the pumping amount, and then that should leave, still leave some discharge for the ecosystem. So that's a steady state uh, water balance. Uh, the, the equation above here is a transient uh, water balance. So the idea is to maintain a steady state water balance so that you know everybody has enough water, including the fish in the uh, streams. So over pumping may cause some problems. One, the large drawdown of groundwater level. Uh, so if you got lots of people pumping from the same aquifer, your well water level may go very low, eventually dry or the reduction of discharge to the rivers uh, or drying out of uh, springs. So we need to avoid these things. So that's the, the current thinking of uh, the groundwater uh, management. So here is where I go into the, uh, the main part of uh, the, the topic today. So the groundwater monitoring uh, by citizen scientists. So, uh, in Rocky View County, which is a county surrounding uh, Calgary. So until about you know, two, three decades ago, the most you know, water groundwater users are traditional users. And this is a generations of uh, uh, farmers uh, using uh, groundwater for their household use or maybe feeding cattle uh, a little bit. And then, uh, so uh, let's say a farmer sells out his 160 acres, all of a sudden there are 40 houses. Uh, that all these 40 houses need water supply, so they're wells. Um, sometimes they you know, uh, have a common well, but often uh, they have one well for each household, so not managed at all. Uh, and then we have some industrial activities, uh, not so much uh, you know, these days, but until about five, 10 years ago, this fracking was a common occurrence. And then they usually don't use groundwater, but there is a notion that, well, maybe they might be taking up uh, groundwater. So there are all, you know, the other uses uh, seem to be increasing in Rocky View County. So there's a desire to monitor the water levels so that, you know, we can maintain that steady state water balance. If there is a deviation, then we can detect it early enough and do something to prevent it from really worsening. Uh, so uh, government of Alberta has about 300 uh, or so wells in the uh, province. Uh, so this is a picture. Uh, this is more, uh, more current. Uh, when we started this program about 20 years ago, that's one day in the program. Uh, some of these wells did not exist. Uh, so two wells in, in, but we have more wells, but still uh, in this mapped area here, uh, so that's Calgary and Rethbridge here, and the Red Deer is not very far, somewhere here, 70,000 square kilometers. That's a huge area. And then only 27 wells are monitored by the province. So that's one well per 2,600 square kilometers. Uh, so that, there's not enough density. And it so happens that when the government set up this uh, monitoring network, they did not put the new wells for the specific purpose of getting the baseline information. They inherited wells from other purposes. Uh, there are some wells put in for monitoring contaminant from uh, some contaminated sites or some wells put in to monitor the, uh, the effects of uh, uh, dams and things like that. So, so really many of these wells are not suitable for local watershed uh, monitoring. In addition to uh, having low density. So, <clears throat> okay, well, one more thing. And then the reason why we need a high density of monitoring wells in the region around here is this. So 
when we talk about monitoring surface water, let's say stream flow, uh, this is a picture of the watershed of West Nose Creek, uh, which is just north of uh, Calgary. Uh, so city of Calgary boundary is somewhere right here and each inching up, but they're actually building houses uh, right around here now. Um, so because the stream network integrates the things that are happening in the watershed, so you don't need many stations to monitor the condition of the stream. In this case, maybe only one station monitoring stream flow might actually tell you a lot about what's happening in this watershed as far as the surface water is concerned. But we have this, it's a highly heterogeneous uh, system. So you got small aquifers, many of them, and each of them may be behaving differently because individual aquifer is separated by this low permeability. So that's why we need more monitoring uh, stations in, for groundwater uh, than for streams. So because of that, uh, we thought, well, we need to put a, a denser uh, monitoring network. And then we actually had uh, sort of a, a, a selfish interest in studying uh, groundwater process in the West Nose Creek watershed without spending too much money drilling uh, water wells. So we talked to uh, the Rocky View County and we started recruiting volunteers. Uh, I'll tell you more about how we did it. But now we have uh, this many wells. These are all monitoring wells uh, set up uh, in the Rocky View County. Uh, so it's publicly accessible database. Uh, so you can uh, go to this site. And then I'll just show you an example uh, now. Okay. Oh, if I can back out of this, uh, escape. Okay. So uh, this, okay. So this is the actual website. Uh, so you got this map and each of this uh, uh, symbols are active. Uh, well 39, this happens to be uh, Dave's well. Um, so I click on that and then we can see the condition of uh, water level in his well. Um, so we, we started it in uh, 2008 uh, and then, so this, uh, the very end of this um, graph is current. I think uh, your last reading was about a couple weeks ago or something like that. Yeah. So it's just still picking up, right? So. What it is, we actually had a, a couple of very dry years. So the this aquifer that Dave is tapping, it didn't receive much recharge. So it was going down, going down because it's a uh, little bit because of pumping, but most of it is just discharging to the creeks, just you know feeding the creek ecosystem. But now it's coming up. Uh, so this will end, you know, in uh, October, November, it will start to go down. But then if we're lucky, we're going to have more rain and snow melt next year. We're going to have another kick of uh, water level. Uh, so that's how, uh, you know, this kind of information might be useful. Uh, and then there are a couple of others. Uh, I was just talking to this person here. Uh, so this is in the northeastern part of the Rocky View County, and then this person's well was pretty stable for the last, you know, um, uh, 15, uh, 16 years, and all of a sudden uh, it started to drop. So last month I received the data and asked the uh, volunteer, well, this must be your mistake. Can you just go out and measure the uh, the well again? So he went out a couple of days ago, and then sure enough, it was low again. So this is an indication that something is happening in the aquifer that his well is tapping. Luckily, he has lots of water in the well, so he doesn't have much to worry about. But I told him, well, you better watch out because you know you could put yourself in a situation where the, you're going to run out of water. So that's a, a sort of um, the usefulness of this type of uh, citizen uh, science approach. So I'm going back to uh, the PowerPoint again. Okay. So 
the this is how we went about setting up this uh, monitoring networks. So uh, we recruited uh, well owners through Rockville County's uh, agricultural field. Man, uh, so this is title is probably not politically correct. So this position does not exist anymore. It's, Basically, it's a liaison person. So the county has this person just know all the farmers in the county, just talk to them. Uh, so it was a, a good for us to liaison through him uh, to connect with the, uh, the well owners. And then we also had an advertisement in the Rocky View newspapers and all that. And then uh, we asked uh, the interested people to submit us the, the well report. So it shows you know, how deep the well is, how long the screen is. So with that, that we just you know selected the wells that are suitable for the long term monitoring, and then a, uh, we sampled uh, water from the well and checked for bacteria uh, just to make sure that you know the monitoring does not cause uh, additional contamination to whatever already was uh, in the well. And then so we distributed this water level. Uh, monitoring device, it's a, a oh, I'm gonna change this to, uh, so a, a oh, pointer, oh, pointer selections, okay, where's the pointer? Okay, so uh, this is basically a tape measure with a little sensor. When this sensor touches the water, it beeps and lets you know that the water is there. And then, uh, so you, yeah, because you're sticking uh, uh, this probe in your drinking water source, you have to disinfect the probe before you stick it in, that kind of things. And then we asked uh, the volunteers to get, if possible, bi-weekly, if not possible, uh, every month or every few months, uh, any reading uh, is useful. So I uh, just did a live demonstration, and this is a compilation of uh, some of the, uh, the well data uh, from different parts of uh, the county. So this number 39 is uh, Dave's well, so it includes his well. Uh, so it kind of have a similar pattern here. So there were good years of recharge, uh, 2012, 13, 14, 2013 was a wet year. We all remember the flood of Calgary 2013. It was a, a wet year in general. And then we had a bit of a drought. I mean, a couple of good years, and then we were in the drought again. So really, the weather pattern shows up in uh, the groundwater level as well. And then a, a, this is a, a, oh, okay, so the uh, arrow is switched. So this is actually uh, this. And then, so that has a similar pattern, but it's a bit more subdued. And then the ones in the Brack Creek area, this red one here, has a large fluctuation because by the time you get to Brack Creek, there's not much of a till, the sediments covering the bedrock aquifer. So the rain and snow melt has, starts having direct impact uh, on the water levels. So um, we're interested in how this uh, groundwater level is related to uh, the creek flow, uh, because the, the idea is to have this integrated uh, groundwater management. So we uh, look at uh, two wells, uh, 325 uh, and another one uh, later, but let's just look at the creek flow in the West Nose Creek and the water level in the 325, which is located right around here. So, so this is a picture of West Nose Creek at the University of Calgary Gauging Station. This is actually me, um, much younger. Um, this was actually 2005, I think, yeah, 20 years ago. Is, so, well, everybody remembers the flood of 2013, but we had a near miss in 2005. It was pretty close. Um, so uh, it, it was then, uh, it was a Sunday morning, um, so I just went out with the uh, chest waders, went into the creek and measured the, uh, the stream flow. And so this is exceptional. And then usually it's a small trickle like this. So this is during the storm flow. This is a graph from 2011. And then the rest is called the base flow. So base flow is important because it really uh, is important for fish and other creatures uh, in the creek. So uh, we are looking at base flow in October for this West Nose Creek. Um, 
So we started monitoring this in 2003. And before that, there was about 10 or 15 years uh, federal government had a monitoring station there. I don't know why they set it up there, but they thought it's important to monitor prairie creeks in Alberta. And then the clutch in and Paul Martin came and then the axed the budget and they just shut down this station. And then we picked it up here at the same place using the same method. So we have uh, uh, many years of record here. So uh, during the wet period, uh, creek base flow went up, fish are happy, and then there was a drought and another drought uh, here. So the base flow was going down. And then this is the water level in uh, well 325. So you see that it mirrors the base flow. So it makes sense, right? Because it's a groundwater discharge sustaining base flow and the groundwater discharge should be greater when there's a more pressure in the aquifer, just pushing the water uh, at a greater rate. So uh, this pattern is closely related to the pattern of the uh, weather. Uh, so this graph is called the standard of pre precipitation index. So it basically shows the deviation from the average precipitation. So it's um, each bar is uh, uh, every month. And then, is, so it's a cumulative effect of uh, the previous 12 months of precipitation. So blue indicates a relatively wet period and red indicates a dry, dry period. So uh, you see that in 80s and 90s, actually there were more red than blue. So it was actually a dry period when the federal government was monitoring the creek flow. And then I picked it up here. And then we actually had a wet period, you know, about 10 years, including the year of Calgary flood 2013. But this was not really normal. And then we had uh, some dry period and creek base flow went down and groundwater level went down. So I have a hunch that uh, if this dry condition continues, so the creek flow and the uh, groundwater level in the aquifer might go back to this condition in the uh, 80s and 90s. So this indicates the importance of long-term perspective in uh, groundwater management. So we cannot look at the you know, past three or four years and then talk about, well, this is how much you can pump. You always have to have this 20, 30 year uh, time span. Um, so that, it's really difficult to do, but that's what we have to do. Now, so you notice that 2023, um, I plotted the creek base flow in this chart, but not the groundwater level in well 325, even though I have the data. So there's a reason why I could not use this point, um, which is this. Okay, so I'm showing the groundwater level in two wells, 212 and 325. Uh, these are the wells we actually have an automated uh, monitoring system uh, going back to 2007. So you see that they follow similar pattern. The well, water level goes up during the wet period, it comes down during the drought until 2022. Okay, And this is what happened in 2023. So the water level in 325 all of a sudden started to decline, decline by you know four or five meters. So th this is not in sync with other wells in the region. This is another indication that there's something happening in this uh, aquifer. So having this baseline monitoring helps to detect uh, some uh, anomalous uh, effect. Uh, so this is not our Water supply, well, it's just a monitoring well, so I'm not concerned, uh, but there are people in the area using this aquifer for their water supply. So if this gets really bad, I have to notify these people about uh, what we are uh, seeing here. Okay, so the last bit of my talk uh, is about, you know, how we can actually engage, you know, people and then keep them engaged uh, for our citizen science uh, approach. So when we started a monitoring uh, network, there are about 50 wells. Uh, this was back in 2007, 2008. So the number was slightly declining. So I looked at the uh, stats. Um, there were this many. Uh, so 11 were monitored by our automated uh, device called a transducer. And then 13 wells were 
reporting the data at least once a month. And then six of them were less than uh, one every two months, or maybe every three or four months. So then that became even more reduced in uh, 2012-13. So we thought, well, okay, we got to figure out why people are just dropping out of our program. So be because you know, keeping the people motivated is a great challenge in citizen science project, especially the one that hope to uh, go for long term. So uh, we did a survey of volunteers. Uh, you might be called receiving a survey, uh, uh, Dave. But uh, um, so there are you know, a few comments. Well, it's not easy to get out and measure the water level in winter when you have two feet of snow uh, covering the well. Well, sure enough, okay. So that's, that's okay. And then what we got is, well, the volunteers actually want to know how their data uh, are used and how how it's helping. So we decided to set up the website. Um, you know, this is called Groundwater Connections. Not so active now, but it's still there. So with this, we try to inform the volunteers about you know, what we're doing, what we're finding. And we all even had a, a great eight teachers working with us to uh, develop a grade eight curriculum on uh, groundwater. And then once a year, uh, I prepare this newsletter um, and then tell them about uh, what we're finding this year uh, and then just give them some background about, you know, the uh, scientific, you know, foundation of uh, water management and things like that. So with that, we were able to retain about the half of the volunteers, even uh, this, this current uh, time period. And then, so we're trying to expand uh, this monitoring network to neighboring counties, uh, the ones that are west and uh, south and east of us. Um, and so this uh, initiative is uh, headed by the Bow River uh, Basin Research uh, Council. So I'm working with them uh, on this expansion program. And in, in the process, uh, I go out to train volunteers. Okay, this is how you uh, measure the water level. These are things that you have to watch out for uh, when you measure the water level. So uh, this is the last slide. So the take home point uh, for tonight's talk is uh, that uh, local network is necessary for groundwater monitoring. So you, we cannot leave this entirely up to the province because they don't really have enough resources. So in Rocky, we were lucky that we were able to take it um, take the matter in their own hands to get the monitoring started. And then community-based approach offers an effective alternative. So they're not you know, uh, mutually exclusive to each other. They can complement. Oh, sorry. Uh, the engagement volunteers through outreach and education is a key to success of the program. And when I tell my colleagues, well, look, you know, we've been doing this for uh, 2008. So what? Well, uh, 16 no, sixteen years, uh, they are surprised how were we able to do this. And it just takes some efforts, but with that, with that we can keep it running. And then we're trying to uh, expand the network to a wider region. So I uh, acknowledge uh, this organization and people uh, who helped uh, us with the project. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, for me, fascinating, and it certainly makes me, uh, uh, you know, on those days when it's been minus 30, I've been out to measure my well, um, wondering why when the wind's blown up your ass, and excuse me, but uh, yeah, yeah. And I've done, I think, 215 over the last 16, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, it puts it all in perspective. So just understanding what's what's going on down there. Um, anyway, um, any questions? Okay, lots of questions. We'll, we'll, we'll start at the back. You could repeat the question just yep. so that possible. For the, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, the question was, uh, I mentioned that 64,000 uh, wells in the province, and that's correct. Uh, it's 
Not entirely. 64,000 wells registered for the Pascapu aquifer system. So that's just in that yellow region that was in the map. Oh, very little. I think maybe a half a dozen dozen are metered um, because most of them are for domestic use. So they don't require a license and they don't, don't have to uh, monitor the water use. Okay, so let's go back on the bar section. Yeah, sorry, I repeat the question again. So the, uh, the second question was, uh, are those wells monitored? I, I said no. Uh, and then, so the, the follow-up follow -up was, well, we have no record of water use in this rather important aquifer. And then that is uh, correct. So province really doesn't know how much water is being pumped from this important aquifer by domestic water users. Licensed ones are different. So like town of Iricana, so they know the uh, licensed amount, and then these licensed users are required to submit the annual report. But those are very few compared to the rest. Uh, Bob, do you, you have a yeah, question? You didn't mention wastewater. Hmm. How much goes back into the system? Good question. So uh, how about wastewater? How much of that is going back to uh, the ground and eventually down to the aquifer? Now, so most of these uh, uh, households will have a septic system. So the wastewater will be discharged to the septic system. And then inevitably, uh, at least part of that will percolate down to the water table and then going back uh, to the aquifer. And then, so we did a rough estimate of that. Because in septic systems are relatively shallow. They don't put it down to deep uh, ground because the idea is that, so you put it in the soil and then there's a percolation through the soil and then that cleans the water before it reaches the water table. So our estimate is that about half of water that is put into the septic system will eventually uh, recharge groundwater. The rest will go back to uh, the atmosphere by evaporation, the plant uptake. But that's just a rough estimate. Okay, I think mean, we'll go over the question online first. Oh, okay. My question. Oh, it's yours. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you showed us well, I think it was 325, as dropping off rapidly, but you didn't explain if there was any known reason for it. You oh, yes. The question was I showed a graph showing this uh, well 325 uh, just you know, dropping down rapidly, um, but I didn't explain the reason. Um, well, the, the, the reason for not explaining reasons, I don't know, but I have some idea. Uh, so these are small aquifers. So these are not, you know, kilometer long aquifer, probably only about a few hundred meters at most. So there is a user, uh, whether new user or existing user, suddenly increasing pumping rate. Um, so, so that's uh, my guess, but I just cannot pinpoint my finger to this house or that house. There are ways to do that, but you know I haven't really gone gone that far. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> Nigel. Three twenty-five. Oh, okay. So that same uh, well, three twenty-five going down. Is that because of the gravel pit? Uh, the answer is no, because this well is in the uh, bedrock formation. Uh, 325 is about uh, 45 meters deep. So this is not influenced by uh, the gravel pit. And then if it's a gravel pit, the change will be gradual. But this was all the sudden dropping. So it must be pumping. It was a pretty shocking photo you showed of 40 homes going up on a quarter section 
Can I ask you to make a prediction of being able to chop in water in 10 years? Ah, uh, yeah. So when you turn 160 acres, a quarter section to 40 homes, um, so the, the water used by this 40 homes, that is sustainable now. Yeah. Uh, well, it really case by case. So when developers do something like that, uh, they have to demonstrate to, I believe, to the Rocky View County that there's enough water for these folks. Uh, so there's some assurance that these folks will not run out of water, but the method they use is the method I showed in the beginning of my, so you do a pumping test for two days and then stretch it over to 20 years, assuming the aquifer is 10,000 kilometers long. So um, yeah, I could see a case where these houses might actually run out of water if they pump too hard. Any further questions, Hugh? Was there any online or? Uh, no questions online, but just a few comments. Uh, excellent insights on the Wales organizers. Thanks very much for Thank you. presenting. And then the other one is really more focused is Dave, it's from uh, Richard, AKA Alan. Uh, your medal is in the post, Dave. Braving the elements as you add to the front of human knowledge. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Just just before we close, and I uh, understand there will be some food coming, is there? Yeah. Um, we we do make, uh, instead of paying you, we make a donation on behalf of uh, uh, ourselves to Operation EyeSight. Um, and I believe that is the certificate the, that uh, is given to you on our behalf. Thank you very much.